That gets my goat. Yeah, so like you said, we we like to write. One thing that I was going to mention, since we were talking about the whole That Gets My Goat, <laughs> is this the last episode of That Gets My Goat? Have we... Have we burned ourselves out on it completely or what? I thought it would be interesting just to talk about the regular show a little bit too. We talked a little bit about it before we came over here to record when we were just hanging out and chilling at Wendy's. You know, someday we've actually even recorded a final episode. So we assume that someday this show will end. Not that gets my goat, but the Doonstie main podcast. Uh, we'll someday finally say, okay, it's time to call it quits. And I've always had in the back of my head kind of a plan for when that comes around a plan that I was going to force you into because you seem to be reluctant to do it and the plan would be yeah we'd you know play our final episode and that would be the end of the Doonstief as we know it and then we would kind of morph into a whole new setup where and I, think I may have mentioned it before where instead of having a podcast every week and a half or two of any random person's story we would instead close up the submissions and we would make the show our show and we would use it as a vehicle for our own stories and we would be kind of a incentive for us because hey next episode is your story Rish you better write it you need to write a story. It needs to be done by the 15th so that we can get it narrated and produced. And yeah, that was kind of my idea. Is each month, we do one story. One month, it would be yours. The next month, it would be mine. And we just alternate back and forth. And we do that every month. And, you know, that gets my goat. Could continue on where we just keep on putting out an episode once a week or so where we just talk about whatever random stuff that we want to talk about. Or we don't, you know, we we don't have that, guess, you know, whatever. I thought that would be a interesting thing to do. And I'm kind of curious to the two people who are listening to the show, if you would be interested in still subscribing to the Doonstief, if we only did Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich stories, or if that would be the time when you say, oh, okay, I don't need to keep subscribing to that feed. I can drop that one off my list and not have to bother with it anymore. And since I have you here, would that be something that you would be interested in doing, Rish Outfield? Well, see, that question is hard to answer, and it has multiple parts to it instead of just yes or no. Just say yes, and we'll move on. <laughs> Part of it is we've got these other stories in progress that other people like Jason Sanford or Rick Kennett are sending us or the Mike Resnick catastrophe Baker stories, which he seems to really enjoy sending us and we get even more pleasure out of producing. I'd hate to give up on those, uh -huh. especially if there are people that eagerly look forward to the new installment to fill in the blank. But I think you're idea was well we can still do those right uh, yeah but we won't have people just randomly sending us stories anymore we'll ask jason sanford the same as you saying okay you're up next right yeah that that's what i was thinking we could still do other people's stories as well as ours here and there but and rather than having submissions they would just be by invitation so we could you know write jason sanford and say hey uh I hear the next Plague Bird story's out. Can we do that on our show? And he'll send it along and, and we'll be happy to do it. Or the next Catastrophe Baker or the next Popoka story or whatever. But uh, yeah, you know, I don't know. I have a hard time and I've, I've said it a thousand times on this show. I have a hard time motivating myself to write. And it's really so super easy to just come up with an excuse and say, oh, well, you know got to get the next episode out or I got to, oh, I got to work on that. And I use the podcast a lot as an excuse. The one thing that I've always assumed though, is if I didn't have the podcast, then I'd use something else as the excuse and I would still not write, which is kind of why I'd like to, rather than ever giving up on the podcast, I'd like to make the podcast instead of an excuse, make it something that forces me to write that motivates me that oh crap my story is next and it's supposed to be done by the 15th 
I better get on it because it's the 13th and I haven't started or whatever. And I feel the same way, maybe even more so. I mean, I don't care about the deadlines or whatever, except for with the damn Dupo Remo. But I've found that I have a certain amount of creativity that burns and doing this podcast uses up that creativity. It fulfills my creative outlet and I don't have to write. I still feel like I accomplished something. Right. And I think that was something I said in the outtakes of like the last Platebird story or something like that, where I just said, thank goodness for this podcast because I don't ever have to write. Right. And so that's almost a negative. But at the same time, you know, it's just, I, it, it's not a waste of time, is it? What no, we're definitely not. I think it's a great thing what and we're doing. If all we were going to do was close submissions permanently and become like Starship Sofa where we still do stories but it's all stories we've asked for I would be completely fine with that if if you want to say submissions are never going to open again and this is the announcement I would be fine with that of course if you wanted to say that this is the last episode ever and the Dune Steve is over I mean I, I wouldn't be fine with that but I respect that but Something you were saying the other day is we don't have to read the really terrible stories anymore. (laughs) That's true. Submissions aren't a burden anymore. That's for sure. We have a bunch of people that volunteer out of their goodness of their hearts, much like me doing the voice of Sinestro, because it's something that they enjoy doing Mm -hmm. and or they enjoy the, the end product or whatever it is. And they have to read crappy stories. And, and, you know, maybe that sounds arrogant that my stories aren't crap. I've submitted lots of stories that didn't make it past the slash readers. And so, you know, it's just like, well, what we get sent to us are the cream of the crop. And that that's made things so much easier where it's just like, okay, we've got three stories this month that have filtered through to the top level and we can decide to do two of them. We can decide to do one of them. You know, what are we going to do? That's been pretty neat. And I think that if even that were to stop, we have a couple of friends that are sending us work still that make up for whatever. You know, there, there are treasures out there that we haven't seen. And that's the only thing that we would lose. New writers that we've never met before. Somebody who's written their very first story and they're going to be the next Anne Rice or Stephen King. And, you know, we, we wouldn't know it because we don't have open submissions. But maybe they'll submit somewhere else and that's that's great. I just, I, I don't know how much of a burden having open submissions is to you. I've enjoyed the hell out of having submissions closed, but it's not really my (laughs) responsibility to read them anyway. You know what I mean? That was something that was hard when we first started that I knew that if I wasn't reading every other story that somebody sent, then I wasn't doing my fair share. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do you remember what a burden that sometimes was when you'd look and there'd be like 12 unread stories? Yeah, it was tough we're putting the question out there, I guess. How many people listen to the Dune Steve because of us? And by us, I mean, they like the stories we pick and they like the productions we do. And how many people listened to it because it's an open market that anybody couldn't submit a story to? And if the answer is nobody does, everybody just likes the final product, then I don't know that we need submissions anymore. Well, I think most likely everybody's going to say they like the final product. They don't listen to it because it's an open market. But I think a lot of people probably do like the possibility that they could someday be one of the stories on the show. And without it being open, that's not a possibility. I was saying to to you before, you know, I think a lot of people listen to the show because they love the BS that you and I spout week after week on uh, each show, which I don't know if that makes them fans of us or not. Well, I would hope I so. I guess that's kind of what that means, but they're fans of our BS. And one thing that I think would be neat to do and maybe we don't have to change anything and maybe we just have to start insinuating ourselves in there more is 
see if we could also make them fans of Rish Outfield stories and Big Anklevich stories and not just Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich BS. Maybe we don't have to change anything. We just have to say, okay, we're going to do one of our stories every two months or something. You know, we'll do every fourth episode or something is going to be our story and then the rest is going to be from the submissions. Maybe that's what we just need to do to, to force ourselves to up our ante and actually write instead of just say why not and then not (laughs) and you know i think that that's fair there are podcasts like drabblecast where norm has said that it's tacky to run your own story on your podcast so he's never going to run another norm sherman story but then there are others like like the Misfits Audios thing or 19 Nocturne Boulevard. I mean, granted, those are audio dramas or whatever, but the, all of the product is written by the makers. It's all homegrown stuff. Uh-huh. And so it's very possible, I would think, to have your cake and eat it too, to do both. But I mean, just the other day, I had this creative spark or creative tidal wave or something. Diarrhea. That, that's very much what it was. And I ended up writing two stories in one day. And I got out an audio drama in progress and I finished it and I printed it out. And yesterday at work, I read it through to, you know, like make notes and stuff. And it was terrible. I mean, it is (laughs) crap, dude. It's it's the stuff that we did at the beginning of this episode is infinitely better than that. And so part of me was just like, oh, F it, man. Why would we even put this on the show? But another part of me was like, who cares? It's something original that I've written for the show and the people that are always pestering us to do voices because there's people that are like, do you have anything? I want to do a voice. Can can you do it? And we never respond. We never have anything <laughs> for them. But it's like it's got a bunch of parts that somebody could do. And it's like, why not do it on the show? And if it sucks, it sucks. But it was original and, and it's out there. I and, mean, you know, originally in that it's never appeared anywhere else. And you know what? Maybe somebody will be amused by it. And I don't know, it, it goes back to the last episode of Dupa Remo. Is it better to try something and fail miserably or not try? I think it depends on what it is you're trying. If okay. you're trying to jump the Grand Canyon and you fail miserably, it's not better. <laughs> because it results in your death. But if you're just doing an audio drama or writing a story or doing something that uh, okay well is it better to have loved and lost than never to have loved okay but it's it's along those lines let's say that you got divorced and it ended horribly and all this stuff and half is mine and and i'm never gonna say and the in-laws and all this fallout that comes from a divorce was it worth having been married to begin with and maybe that's an opinion thing maybe a, a bad enough breakup tends to erase all the good times but but it can't erase all the good times it may erase your perception Mm -hmm. of the good times but it seems like something like that was like okay well it's up to you to decide whether you wish that you'd never gotten married to begin with and maybe that's a terrible example well i don't know that it applies too well but you know uh, we, we got the email from somebody when we were talking about taking the the stories and we've talked about this already we've mentioned it like five times at least on the show where you and i wrote by chance some broken mirror stories that followed the same premise and we were planning on releasing those on smash words or whatever the crap it is that all the ebook stuff goes on for like a buck or two right bucks. right and one of our listeners volunteered to help us put that together and rish was saying yeah we're, we're still planning on doing that you know we got to finish the broken mirror event uh, get those all read and then we can probably get those stories you know f- all polished up and ready to go but yeah, you know, I don't know. The other thing is I'm always worried about putting my stuff out. And he said, I, I think it's Mer Lafferty, I guess he quoted, although he also quoted you and said, well, uh, there's this one guy who always says, why not? Um, but he also quoted Mer Lafferty, who said, what's, I, I guess her thing is, what's the worst that could happen? That, I think, is how you figure out whether it's better to give it a shot or not. What's the worst that could happen? You put it out there and people say, yeah, that sucked. That's really not that bad of a thing. They don't even kick you in the nuts. 
I mean, that would be enough reason to say, no, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to try it because if they don't like it, they get to kick me in the nuts. And that hurts. But it doesn't, I mean, it might hurt your ego or whatever for someone to say, you know, yeah, that story kind of sucked. But that's the worst that can happen. They can't, they're not going to physically injure you. They're not going to take away your livelihood, your money from your wallet or whatever it is. They're just going to say it wasn't good. And when that's the worst that can happen, I, I think it's worth it. That's fair. I, I know that the whole, we need to polish it and, and make it better or perfect. I mean, make, you know, go over it one more time kind of thing. That's an endless loop. <laughs> Nothing will ever be perfect. True. Uh, eventually, rewriting something enough times, I'm just going to say it's all crap. Yep. I don't want that and shared with right everybody. Then. And you'll yeah. probably be right by then. But I imagine the end result would be the same if I just sent it to that guy who's volunteered. I just out of the kindness of his heart to do this for us. Then if I said, okay, well, we'll wait. And on September 1st, after all these revisions, I'm going to send it to you. <laughs> because if it's a good story, it's a good story. If I have writing talent, I have it. You can't force it into being. Mm -hmm. I, I am cowardly. I'm, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of all sorts of things. And rejection is a huge thing that has just loomed over me like a shadow over everything that I do. Yet there's so many people less talented than me that go out and say, I'm going to send this everywhere. I'm going to self-publish this. I'm going to have my parents self-publish this. Now I'm a multimillionaire. <laughs> um, yeah, you know who I'm talking about. But it's just the difference between me and that guy is not that I have loads of talent and he has very little. It's that he actually did something. He accomplished something. He sent it out there and he found somebody that latched onto it. I told you that my friend that I went to high school with said that there's only one book series worth reading and it was his book series. And I was just like, what the crap are you talking about? And he's <laughs> like, I couldn't even make it through that God awful last Harry Potter. But yet he latches on to these books, these dragon books. Wow, dude, who knows if there's somebody out there who would feel the same way about something that I wrote and they'll never I guarantee know. you that there is. They'll never know because I'm too cowardly <laughs> to send it in. Okay, you and I, and, and we're just talking here again, same as the Dupo Remo, pretend that there's nobody else in the room so we can be completely honest. I love to kill little kids, yes. <laughs> you and I wrote these stories about... Okay. Uh, wait, that, uh, about, that's our lawyer calling. Hold on a minute. <laughs> Uh, yeah, he says you can't say that. You're gonna uh, you're gonna need to edit that one out. Oh, right? okay. I love to kill younglings because that makes it all right. <laughs> oh god, they're robots. You like to kill baby robots. There we go. <laughs> and baby aliens. And, and, and I love to club baby <laughs> seals. And clones. You can kill baby clones. That's okay. Okay, so here's the thing. You and I both independently wrote stories about. Ugly girls who in in uh, who become pretty. who explicitly become <laughs> right. I, I mean that's the premise of this thing, and it sounds like we're talking each other up, and we're going to do this thing. At least that feels like the end result. Oh, of we're going to do it. You sent me the story. I have a copy of it. <laughs> so even if you say no, it's too late. What do you think of the story that you wrote? How do you feel that you did? And if you don't feel like the story is good. Do you feel like it's good enough to let somebody read just because it's, why not? Because what's the worst that can happen? There you go. Um, you know, I feel that the story is good. I don't know if it's great. I have a hard time putting a, a handle on that. I think you and I have talked about that before. I can't remember w when that was. Oh, that was a feature is, that's going to be coming up. This is something up. we're going to talk about in, later in March on the re real show. Yeah, how do you know if and, something is great? And, and yeah, you know, we'll probably have the actual announcement that this is leading up to be in the real show and have that conversation preface the announcement. What do you think? Okay. Because we'll send the stories to the Smashwords guy or whatever. When he says they're ready to go, we'll do that episode on the real show. Or we can have this conversation during the Broken Mirror. Okay. Understanding when something is great. I don't know if there is even such a thing because it's such a subjective thing too. Like you said, the one guy, he loves those books that you 
personally feel are just complete ripoff books. Okay, the first one was. I, they, they might get better and better and better. And he thinks they're the only series worth reading. He thinks Harry Potter is pure crap. So it's a completely subjective thing, what's great and what isn't great. I think knowing whether your story is good or not good is more empirical than subjective. You can look at it and say, yeah. Even with like, you know, we we haven't been doing this for a while because we've got the slush readers, but with Broken Mirror Stories, we got to read every single one. Some of them may not have made it past the slush readers to begin with, and we would have never seen them if they were submitted normally. But instead, we got to see all of them. And I have looked at some of the various, uh, you know, people's scores for all these things, and they, they range all over the place. Uh, for my my story itself, I, I was complaining to you. Somebody gave me a one. The lowest possible the score. The lowest possible score, but someone also gave me a 10. The highest possible score that you can get. So... <sighs> but what does that mean? How I'm is not that sure. Because, I mean, honestly, that shouldn't be possible. You wouldn't think so. I think the person who gave me one must have had some kind of a strong reaction to something that my story may have referred to rather than the story itself. They had an ulterior motive. And they said, oh, screw this guy for talking about this or that or whatever. I'm not sure. But yeah, I think good is more, you know, something you can say, okay, this story is good and I'll give it to you and you will say, eh, it's not my favorite, but it's good. You can read it and say, okay, this is well written. It's not the story that I like, but it's well written. The person is adequate. The person is capable of telling a story. Right, he's capable of telling the story. He adequately puts sentences together. I'm not confused when I'm done. I'm not throwing the story against the wall and vowing that I'll only watch TV for the rest of my life and never read another word. You know, that I think is something that you can just say, okay, this is good, but... The great thing is is a personal thing. I think everybody's going to... One person loves, other person hates. There's no getting it something that's universally great. Good you can get. Well, this is something that's making me really want to talk about that. <laughs> or do that episode, you know. I asked people for their their thoughts. They were like, how do you know? Honestly. How look, do you if, know? If I had gotten the one, a uh, one, and you know what? Maybe I did, and thank you for not saying... On my Sadly, story. I wish I could tell you you got um, a one, but but you didn't. What what? Only me. And, and, I, and I apologize if this sounds like I'm condemning you because I'm I'm not. I think you're a good writer, and if I've read your story already, hopefully I gave it a good score. It was you that gave me the one. But Thanks, the douche. Thing is, if somebody gave me a one, that's saying you can't tell a story. You don't know what you're doing, kind of thing. The lowest score I gave to one of the stories was to one that was not a story. It was nothing. It was it it made no sense. I read it aloud. It was translated from a dead language. <laughs> so it's just it's one of those things. I think I can tell a story. You know, I, I better be able to because I've been doing it for twenty years. And if somebody gave me a one, I I probably would fall into a depression and question that. But you can't let that happen. You have to have confidence. That 20 years of doing something, I mean, 22 years now for me, has taught me at least some kind of skill or, you know, practicing something for 22 years, you should know at least the rudiments of storytelling or, or, or baseball or of, of, of clubbing baby seals, whatever it might be. And, and so I, I wish that you hadn't gotten that score. <laughs> and once again... I became very angry on your behalf about it. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. I love it when people do that. I, and I know that that's a crappy thing, <laughs> but it's it wasn't right. I, and you know what? Maybe I haven't read that story. And maybe I'll end up giving you yeah, a crappy he'll, score. He'll Dude, give me the other one. Although I, I, I probably would feel really bad. You know me. I, I tend <laughs> to try and find good in all of these stories. And my scores are going to be higher than the average. Yeah, yours are scores uh, are generally higher than my scores, so... And that's partly because I'm an empathetic person and I, I, I know what it's like to walk across that dance floor and have the girl say, no, I won't dance to you with the Duran Duran song or whatever. And you're just like, well, ah, and you wilt and you go all the way back the long walk. But it's, to the other but side. it's ordinary world. That one's really good. And so 
And, and you know what? That's partly a flaw of mine. I actually was a reader for an agency in Los Angeles, for a, liter- a, a talent agency that would get script submissions. And I would always try and say, this is good first, you know, the same that I do with the submissions now. Try and find something good. And there were times when it was difficult. It was rare because these are people that are good enough to have an agent that submitted their, their work. So, but so, you know what, as, as a job, maybe I'm not the best person cut out for that because I'm a sensitive soul and I would imagine that the person who wrote this is also sensitive. You probably shouldn't be that way. And the same thing with what we were talking about. Send out that story and if 10 people love it, but 90 people don't respond to it at all, you've got 10 people that suddenly are a fan of your work. Right. And, and I don't know why I can't see that and say, you know, like Scott Pig really liked the daily podcasting thing. And why can't I just say, hey, Scott Pig, he rules and he's really all I need. <laughs> yeah, there was a few other people. There was somebody, the, the person who brought to my attention that episode 25 did not make the feed was like, hey, hey, I, I need my daily Doom Steve. Where is episode 25? It's not on the feed. Ah. And there's a writer that I criticized today that we won't mention, but somebody that thinks really highly of their own work, and they're always talking about it on their show. And I was just oh, like... Was that... Wait, is this writer in the room? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. Uh, they're, they're very self-serving, and they're very proud of themselves. We like ourselves, don't we? And even though I criticize that, that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's something that's necessary. That's something that that needs to be engendered in anybody who wants to put themselves out there creatively. The belief that their stuff is worth checking out, more worth what you're putting out or what he's putting out or what they're putting out or what I'm putting out, you know? And so I I criticize. I wish I were more like that. I wish I was like 80% of the people said it was shit. They're all stupid. I, I don't know how I'll ever figure that out. I mean, maybe I need to go to a therapist or a hypnotist or, or something like that. But uh, yeah, with, with my story, the pseudo broken mirror thing that we're going to put out there. Um, pseudo echo. Won't you take me to Funky Town? I think it's a good idea. It's a good premise. And obviously it was a good premise because you went with it too independent of me you know maybe what i need to do is put out all of my work and see what people respond to and try and identify what the stories have in common that people really respond Mm -hmm. to and try and and internalize the things that people say they didn't like yeah that's what i was going to say the whatever comments they say hey you know this was weak get enough of those comments and you realize maybe that's something you need to work on it's hard to just gauge that yourself. You write something, hey, I love it. I wrote it. It's great. But uh, when somebody else gives you, you know, a few people give you the comment that, hey, your characters are a little thin, probably need to flesh them out a little bit more, especially giving them big jugs. That's a good way to flesh out the character. The more you hear that, maybe you realize, oh, geez, uh, maybe I better start doing that because that's how I need to improve. You've been writing for 22 years, but... How much feedback have you allowed yourself to get to improve? Yeah, you've practiced shooting hoops for 22 years, but you've never had somebody trying to block you. Yeah, there you go. You never played against a defense, and all of a sudden you go out there, and it's a lot harder to make that shot now. And we've we've done a few Rish Outfield stories on this show. I think we may have even did one thing that was called a B.D. Anklevich story or Big Anklevich story or whatever we called that stupid ghost story that I did. We've done a few stories like that, but we've also snuck in a story or two under pseudonyms. And the one thing that I, I found as a really big compliment is there was somebody who absolutely loved my story, the story that I wrote. And that same but story. But they weren't trying to suck up. Yeah, they weren't sucking up. Anklevich, they don't they, know. Yeah. And the other thing that I found was really interesting too is I didn't produce one of the stories that I put out under my own name. 
I just sent it out with all the other stories to the producers and say, said, hey, whatever your favorite story is, pick whichever one you want to do. And one of our producers wrote back and said, oh, I really want to do this story by this guy. Oh, it's really cool. And it's a producer that I really respect a lot. And I was just like, wow, this guy likes my story above. And I don't know what was in the batch of stories to choose from. Heck, maybe he was like, nah, well, you know, this Mike Resnick guy and this Jason Sanford, they're not for me. But oh, this Big Anklevich story. Of course, he didn't say Big Anklevich because a pseudonym, but he actually chose it. I think he said, oh, this Abby Merck Rustad. (laughs) Nice try. But yeah, you know, he actually picked it as the story that he wanted, which was, I thought, really cool. That's one thing that I guess I want to give up is the hiding behind pseudonym thing and actually just say, okay, this is Big Anklevich. Tell me what you think. Maybe folks can comment on here. I know we don't get a lot of comments because folks don't listen to Dupo Remo much, but if you're interested in hearing stories from Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich on the show, let us know. If you're not interested, you can also let us know. Say if you're the person that's just like, no, you know, I'd skip that. I wouldn't download that. Hopefully we've said something to this point that would make that person comment anyway. Because we were giving the option of doing away with submissions and things like Mm -hmm. that. So tell us what you think. This this, this is a more, what's the word, unguarded personal discussion than we usually have. Or or that's what that gets my goat has become, is just you and me shooting the breeze. And and That's because the summer movies aren't back yet. Uh, Hunger Games is coming soon. We'll, We'll have to pick that up there. (laughs) <laughs> I guess so. Uh, John Carter is open by the time this episode airs. Oh, well, there you go. Anyhow, there are so many things that you could have done that you didn't do in your life and, and, and all that. And it, it's got to just suck. Jeez, I hate doing this. I hate starting a new topic. But uh, one minute. There's this documentary called Best Worst Movie. And it's about the making of Troll 2 which is regarded by many to be the absolute worst film ever made. One of those so bad it's good movies. And it's a new documentary, and I have meant to talk about it before because there's, it's fascinating. I could not recommend Best Worst Movie more. There's so much to recommend it. But one of the cast members of Troll 2 is an old man, an old guy that lives in Utah or some godforsaken place. And they interview him, and he's... At the end of his life, literally. I mean, he he's now dead. And he talks about never having any kids. And he talks about not having been married. And the one thing that he ever did of any consequence is considered the worst movie ever made. And he said, I wasted my life. And just this moment of, of, of utter despair from this old guy. And I when I saw that, it was like a slap to the face. I I cried. I couldn't believe that a person would feel like that. That it's like, I wasted my life and now I'm going to die. And to me, it was just like, that's the most horrible, conceivable thing to realize that you've wasted your life or whatever. And so we got to grab on to the opportunities that come or, or take the risks or, or, or do the things that might conceivably make you happy or might conceivably give you a good return or, or a good experience or, or any of that stuff. And so, I mean, here we are face, face to face, face <laughs> at the end of this podcast. And, and, and I mean, I, I have a renewed determination that we will put at least that pair of stories out. And, and a part of me right now is just like psyched up, you know, like Kevin Smith just said, why not? And he said cock a bunch of times. <laughs> And I'm just, but in between all those cocks, he did say, why not? I, and, you know, the adrenaline is flowing and I'm calling you from San Diego and saying, oh, my gosh, we got to do this and we got to do that because you know, the life is finite and you only have so many opportunities in that. And we have a forum. And I feel like right now nobody goes to like, the forum, though, the, but they should. <laughs> I feel like right now we you and I should put out that duo of stories and then we should immediately put out another couple and and which well fudge put them all out right now and say okay you can choose this topic that we talk about you can choose this topic that we talk about and all that and i, I again like i said that day with the why not conversation why can't this feeling last why can't i continue to mm. gain energy f- from this battery of motivation and all that and i don't why know can't you put it in a bottle and 
pull it out and drink some more of it when uh, you feel like you're running low. But the, the horror of that statement from that poor old man. And, you know, gosh, I, I hope that once the cameras stopped shooting on that documentary, somebody put their arm around that guy and said, you know, 50 years from now, people are still going to be talking about how crappy Troll 2 was. You're going to be remembered when your prospective grandchildren would be old, you know, or something like that. And I, and I just don't know. What a just what an empty, awful, vacant, bleak thing for a person to say. And... Here's the crazy thing is after he said that, you go to this guy's IMDb page and there are comments on the bottom for a man who did one movie that nobody saw, that everybody hates, saying, RIP, dude, you know, I hope you're in a better place and all this stuff. This guy touched people like he touched me and all that. And and he probably went to his grave not knowing that, that he motivated and he helped and he inspired. And it's just like this guy didn't live his life in vain. He didn't. I love that guy. I don't even know his name. And other people do too. People in other countries. <laughs> you know, it's just that, that, that. Nobody should feel like that. Nobody should live their life feeling like they have failed. The more you know. Do, 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 do. Yeah. The, you know, today is, was a crappy weather day. As we were driving over here, it took me an hour and a half with, when it normally takes me about 45 minutes to get to the place where we normally meet before we come here. And on top of that, I work in the news and we cover a fatal accident at least once a week, it seems, if not once a day, almost. There was some kid... On Monday, there was this horrible one that happened just while I was on the way to work. And the guy, yeah, he died. And Yeah, there was one last night. A kid was messing around in his car and he wound up rolling his car and crashing into a light post. And died and you never know when that's going to happen too so you can't just wait and say oh yeah you know rich outfield says why not so you're coming up soon i think i'm gonna i'm gonna try something you don't know if you get to be as old as that guy who said oh i wasted my life i'm old and i didn't do anything maybe you will never get that old maybe your time's coming soon you don't know (sighs) it That kind of stuff, you know, I just imagine what it was like for those people that were in those accidents. Did they even know? Were they just driving along and the next second, boom, they're just gone. Completely over. They don't even have a time to say, oh, crap. I don't know. You never know when it's going to happen. So you really got to seize the day as old Robin Williams taught us back in in the day when I'd never heard that expression until then. Now it's everywhere. But hey, thank goodness for that movie. Yeah. I mean, I know it's a cliche and I know people say it all the time. And in that terrible, terrible audio drama that I read through yesterday. Oh, the one that that I wrote. wrote, Okay. I was like, the Green Lantern one you said was good. Carpe Diem is in there. And I got that from that movie. But but thank goodness that that movie exists. Yeah. It definitely teaches people something important, I think. And I'm here to reiterate it. You got to do it while you have the chance because you don't know when your chance is over. So... I think it's time for us to perhaps take a chance as well. So like I said, we're going to do. Those stories are going out. You can try and resist it, but it's too late. You sent me a copy. So you can give me your edited version that you did, or I'll just edit it myself. But it's going out. Well, yeah, screw it. Just you do it. (laughs) Don't give me the chance to renege, man, because you know me. I'll say, okay, hey, just give me a few more days. And a few more days, it'll be 2014. (laughs) <laughs> Just, yeah, I, I, I thought it was good enough to send to you to read, change whatever needs to be changed and send it to that dude and let the, whoever's listening right now read it. And, and if, you know, if they don't like it, maybe they'll like the next one. There we go. All right. Well, I think uh, we've said our piece and for today. Yeah, and a half, maybe two pieces. That's my problem. I got to stop eating two pieces. Just That's a topic for another day. Carpe diem doesn't mean you have to eat every last bit of food that's in front of you while well, you can it does not seize the plate it seize <laughs> the day anyways yeah thanks for listening folks i'm big anklevich i'm rich outfield hey why not that's right that gets my go is produced under a creative commons okay. 3.0 license see i didn't know what that was going to lead into so and then it goes just to you're listening. You're listening. To take, say it mean. I guess my goat. <laughs> I get you goat.
How dare you? <laughs> None of you would be live if it went for that gets my goat. So let's do the postmortem episode, and it can, it can be really short if you want to. No, or we be, can talk about... It can be anyway. forever long. Okay. It will be 10 parts, and we will release it every day for a month. It's funny you should... It's funny I should what? Scratch yourself. In front of <sighs> that people. is funny.